please let's give a nice welcome to Maria Resnick. I had to ask permission if I could take my mask off. I don't think, yeah. So I, I want to take your questions. First of all, this wasn't here when I was here. I graduated class of 1982. So I'm really old. Um, I am. I'm 58 this year, right? I'm almost going to retire, but I don't think I can. Anyway, I look back at these, the times here, and my classmate, she used to be Shelley Finkelstein, and I just saw her here. Um, so we were walking through these schools, uh, and you get what you give. I think in everything in life, you get what you give. So I threw a lot of time in Tom's River North. Tom's River North threw a lot into each of you here, into me. So. I'm going to give the mic to you. Tell me what you're interested in, right? What, how can I help? Yeah. Tell me your name. Hello, I'm Jackie Anderson. Jackie. Sorry, I'll put it um, I just wanted to ask, really, what inspired you to make the impact that you have? Because I also greatly admire you, and I, I do want to make an impact similar to yours. Jackie, thank you. Uh, so here's the hard part, right? Someone, someone asked me, how do you win a Nobel Prize? I, you don't. You can't make it the goal. I think what you do is you find the strand and begin to pull something that you're good at or that you love. One of the other two things. And then, and then you keep pulling. And you get better and better and better. And because you get better and better and better, you have impact. So it, it always starts with one. Then you bring, in, you bring your group in, and your group grows. One of the things, Shelly Shelley went to high school with me. One of the things she reminded me of is that you know, at, a, at a time when we weren't very close friends, I was a nerd, but I would play basketball, and I did theater, and I did orchestra. So it was really hard, the stereotypes you try to break, right? Shelly remembered this time when, uh, in our class fundraising, I asked her, to join us to pick up garbage at Great Adventure. And it was really fun. And we raised money for the class. And it was just a different way of doing it. Did it create impact for our prom? Yeah, <laughs> you know? Um, so sometimes, I guess what I've tried to do is, whatever you do in the moment, whatever you like doing tomorrow and the next day, you, you pull out just a little bit to try to see, OK, so as I learn, how, how big does it get? You want to walk the same path. And this is something I tell folks in Rapplers. You know, if I'm recruiting you for Rappler, I want to find out what you want to do. And then we walk the path together. I would say, whatever you really love right now, see where you would go three years, five years. And it's hard to think about that in high school. But it's like, if you love it, you, you will get better and better, and how does it fit in? The big stuff, like student council, student government, uh, I don't know if you have all state or girl state, is that still there? All state orchestra, there was boy state and girl state, no more. You still do, right? All of those things that you do, like my orchestra teacher was Mr. Spaulding, and he pushed me to, to do Garden State Philharmonic, to do all state, those auditions. You meet people all the time. And those people come back in your life. Um, so I guess that's always push to learn. Be aware in the moment, the friends that you have as you get older, they, they get older with you and you become more influential together. That's kind of how you create impact, right? I mean, if you look at just social network theory, it's your group that rises together. Does that make sense? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, tell me your name. Hello, um, my name's Kyle Reinheimer. Kyle? So I wanted to ask you if, can you remember any defining moment in your life where you looked at it and said, okay, this is gonna lead me down the path to what the rest of my life is gonna be? Uh, where you choose to go to college. And I'm not gonna say it just because Ben is here, but, um, <laughs> so I applied to 13 colleges nerd right but i wasn't sure i was I, I wanted my i'm asian american so my my parents wanted me to be a doctor 
but I didn't really want to be a doctor, so I applied to six-year med programs. Like you, you know that, f that saying, um, if you aim here and you're down there, then you'll get maybe halfway. Aim, aim as high as you can, and you, you may not reach it, but you will reach higher than if your, your goal is easier to reach. Does that make sense? Going to Princeton was huge because I was a pub public school kid. I walked into a place where you know people were highly competitive um, and came from all over the country. I think that's the other part. Like, it's so cool to, to be back here and to see you because Tom's River is, you know, also cherish the time in Tom's River because when you leave, you, if you leave, I've had friends who stayed here and built their lives here. So uh, choosing a school was a big one. Um, I almost went to West Point because I thought I needed discipline. Um, so I'm, now you know how old I am. I, I was afraid, you know, I wanted to stay physically fit. Um, so college, choosing your college. The other part is boyfriend, girlfriend, choosing your partner will be critical because those also align with your values. Not that you can choose who you fall in love with, but the partner you spend your life with, that, that's also important. My book that's coming out this year, is, the title is How to Stand Up to a Dictator. But it could also be How to Stand Up to a Bully, right? Because in the end, that's where it was. I, I wrote about Tom's River North in, a, in the second chapter, I think. And I wrote about the orchestra room, which we just passed, and how there was this girl, I didn't say her real name, let's call her Lisa, who, um, who was being bullied. And so choosing, do you sit on the sidelines and watch people bully someone? Which, it's kind of frightening if you step in in front of a bully, right? Or do you help? At one point, I just saw her crying on the side in the, in the orchestra room, and I got a tissue paper and gave it to her, and we became friends. I was afraid that, I, that, that if she gets bullied, I'll get bullied, and it almost happened. But then my friends, the nerds, <laughs> also came in and helped. It's these little moments that define your values, that define who you are. And so even something simple like standing up against a bully, the stereotypes of, of people are, are the same, whether you're in high school, in college, in government, in journalism. They're good and bad. And, and what I think makes it good is when you are with people who have the same values, who stand up for the same ideals. That's the other part. Hang on to your ideals, because you can make the world the way you want it to be. Yeah, tell me your name. I should put a mask on. Hi, I'm Rebecca Romogato. Um, how did you manage to like keep up with like all the activities you did in school? Like, Did it ever like overstress you out, or like how did you manage to do all that? When I first moved to Tom's River, and I could barely speak English. Uh, ang, ang sinasabi namin, Pilipino. Pilipino kaming magsalita. My third grade teacher, she told me that I was so quiet that almost for a year I didn't talk. And it was the school system, Silver Bay, that actually gave me piano lessons. I think more than anything, I wanted to learn. So whether that is playing an instrument, like Mr. S Mr. Spaulding, uh, for, I took the violin, but then I played almost all the same, all the string instruments, because he would teach, and I would take the time. Did I get stressed out? Senior year, that's when I didn't have straight A's. <laughs> senior year, because senior year. <laughs> but I aimed for it, you know? That's why it wasn't valedictory. No, <laughs> it's senior year, right? So you choose at a certain point. Now I have to choose a lot more, but I like being a jack of all trades, especially now in your world with technology, with social media, the people who will crack this. So first of all, the world, the way us oldies knew it, know it is dead. You will create the new world because technology now, you know, um, there's going to have to be legislation to control this, but it's quite insidiously manipulating you on social media. Um, the Facebook whistleblower, Frances Haugen, if you guys are on Instagram, you know that if you're a teenage girl, that it's 
manipulative of you, right? Even if you're a teenage boy, you know, it, it's, it can be really tough. So don't always follow the crowd, right? That's going to change because legislation is going to be put in place to protect us. It's become a behavior modification system. This phone that you have, depending on how many apps you have on it, each of those apps is gathering data of everything you do. And that data then is owned by these large corporations. That's used, that can be used in different ways. Anyway, to go back to, to, go back to what you asked, you will create this new world. You're a product of this kind of um, twisted information ecosystem. I love how much more diverse this high school is than when I was here. And the fracture lines of society are being pounded open on social media. And the worst of human nature is what is being encouraged. So how do you be the best you can be when what's being rewarded is the bully? You will create the world. I guess that's, so that's what you have in front of you. Does that sound daunting? Don't be daunted. <laughs> the person who will win, who will find the solution, is a person who cuts across. I know science, math, very, very important, but humanities, humanities reminds us of being human. Complete English major, sorry. Let me take other questions. Um, so I'm Gabriela Casova, and my question to you was, when you first immigrated to America, did you feel any pressure to succeed in your classes or in anything, just like in regular life, so you can like prove to everyone around you that you were just as equal as them? And what was like the hardest thing for you? Was it learning the language or something like fitting in? Wow, you, that's fantastic questions. Uh, up until high school, maybe through college, I felt like there was a devil on my shoulder kind of pounding me to do well. I felt like I needed to prove that I belonged. It's like Pascal's Wager. Are you guys familiar with Pascal's Wager? The question is, you know, should I believe in God? Do you believe in God? And Pas Pascal said, well, if you don't believe in God and there is a God, if you choose not to believe in God and there is a God, then you're kind of screwed, sorry, you know. But then if you choose to believe in God and there is no God, you lose nothing. I paraphrased him in a bad way. So it's like Pascal's wager, right? If I was learning and growing and building my resume, I have a really good resume, <laughs> um, then I'm doing the right thing up until, because don't put so much pressure on yourself to know, because you don't know. And sometimes you don't know until you do know in terms of what you want to be. That's OK, right? You walk your way into the answer, which is harder, fitting in or proving that you belong. They're kind of two sides of the same coin. So it was important that I do, I aim to be the best at what I did, which sounds really, it drives you to be, to be your best, right? And then the other part is, I'm just so thrilled. You will find your friends. And I learned, it was high school where I learned that not everyone's, that I shouldn't care about everyone's opinion, right? Like some people will really not like you. That's okay. Um, if they bully you, then that's something different. Uh, but sorry, it's because of this how to stand up to a dictator, you know, trying to make dictator. So it, fitting in is, is part of whatever you do for the rest of your life. After you graduate high school, you'll go to college if you decide to go to college, or your job, do you want to fit in? It's important to find the right balance, but for me, the line always is, um, what things are non-negotiable for me? Like, I want to be a good person. Here's a really simple rule that I, I figured this out in Tom's River. How do I live my life? If I have to make a quick decision about something, the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's really simple, and it works. All the way until now, if I, you know, if I'm in a tough situation and I don't know what to do, I will act in a way that I would, I would have someone do unto me, do unto others as you would. Sorry, Christian or Catholic, Philippines is Asia's largest Roman Catholic nation. So it's a little bit of both, I think. I think connected to that is something I say all the time now, because people always ask me, how do you find courage? You gotta have courage, right? 
And I, I did it, and I learned this in Tom Surfer. Embrace your fear. Whatever you're most afraid of, whether it's like in basketball, my coach, so I'm still in touch with my, my basketball coach and, um, and my student advisor. In basketball, you know, if you're going to push yourself, uh, whatever that is you're most afraid of, whether it's in sports or whether it's in, in classes, or whether it's, do you like this guy, right? Whatever it is you're most afraid of, you touch it, you hold it, and embrace it. Because if you take the sting out of your fear, you are unstoppable. So if you're afraid that someone will think you're teacher's pet, yeah, I had all of that. Right? If, who cares? <laughs> Embrace it. Does that make sense? I can read. Tell me your name. Uh, I'm Steven Avapo. Uh, I was just wondering, when you hit your lowest point, how did you respond to that? Or like, how did you uh, come back from that? And how did you get yourself out that door when you just felt really down low? lowest point would be like in high school probably not getting straight A's uh, no uh, I'll tell you one that I remember that I really can't forget it's a decision from being in war zone coverage I ran the CNN team in East Timor Timor Leste uh, it became Asia's uh, the world's newest nation in 1999-2000. Leading up to that, there was violence, and I was leading coverage, right? So my team was driving out from the capital, Dili, and it's like a, a four-hour drive to a city called Suwai, because we heard that there were these, these people in a church who were afraid and that the military was coming after them. East Timor was fighting for its independence from Indonesia, which is the world's largest Muslim population. We were driving through and stopped in a town called Liquisha. I was a reporter, and at that point, there's, there's a vote for independence. Pro-independence, or if you're anti-independence, they were, there were kind of these goons who were working with the Indonesian military. One of my sources, who's pro-independence, he asked me if he could ride with us because he felt that his life was being threatened. And I have my team, right? Uh, we were going still like three hours further away and so I told him no 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 we can't take you with us because if we take an uh, if we took him with us we become a target as well and we needed to go report so you have to make these decisions and and I told him we'll come back and pick you up on the way back we'll meet you here at seven o'clock in this in this area so we go there was a massacre in Suai it was a church massacre we're, we're driving back we're an hour late that night we get to where we're supposed to meet him, and we waited 45 minutes. And it had to be 45 minutes because I couldn't wait any longer because I needed to file. He never showed up, and only later did I hear that he was killed. He was killed. He was right. He was afraid for his life, and he was... So that has haunted me like, that was a long time ago. And it's haunted me because it was a decision that should we have taken him with us? So you make these split-second decisions, and, and it ripples through your, your world. So how do I cope? I go over it over and over and over in my head, whatever that failure point is. I don't know. I, I go over and over and over, and I try very hard to see, could I have done better? In that situation, I couldn't. And I still, like, I, I still think about it. I know his family, and I'm still in touch with them. But it was the right decision at that point in time. The other things, you know, as you, as you get older, as you get married, as you have kids. Does that seem far away? It, it might seem far away. <laughs> Not that far away. It goes like this. Now I feel old. <laughs> no, but as you do that, you build yourself. You create who you are. You find meaning in your life in these small decisions that in the moment you may not realize will have, um, will mean anything, right? How do you get ready for those small decisions? You know your values, you know who you are, um, and you make and you do unto others as you would have them do unto you. 
Never let something that you fail at stop you. In fact, if you don't fail at anything, it means you haven't risked enough. It means you know, you, you kind of stayed at a medium point because you can't succeed at everything, right? So, and, and failure teaches you also. I was more careful in the, few, it, you know, in, in the succeeding years. That was 1999. That was how long ago that was. So failure and success, don't look at them as, you know, it's not a zero sum game. Sometimes startup, I started a startup, Rappler is a startup in the Philippines and 90% of startups fail, right? Very few startups actually succeed. We're 10 years old now. But when we started, we didn't know whether we were gonna succeed or fail and that is part of the fun. Does that make sense? You have to risk so that it makes the winning that much better. Gender. <laughs> Hi, I'm a friend of Shetty, and I was just wondering, what inspired you to start exposing corrupt governments and corrupt government officials? Oh, I like you. What inspired me to start exposing corrupt government and corrupt government officials? We know what's right and we know what's wrong. Right? We all do. I think even in, in school we knew this. And people will say, don't be a tattletale when it's personal. The honor code at Princeton is the best. I still use it in a, as an example of, of the kind of world I want to live in, which is the, uh, the honor code is that every exam or every paper you, you do, you, know, you pledge on your honor that you didn't cheat. Right? And then here's the part that's more important than you not cheating is that you would report everyone else around you, anyone around you, you see cheating. It was how I began to be a journalist. And then when I took over, I took over the largest news organization in, AB, in the Philippines in 2005. And when I, I took a zero tolerance approach to corruption and fired some of our best people when we had evidence that they accepted a bribe. So it, it isn't just public officials. So as a journalist, part of our jobs, the mission is to hold power to account. And how do you hold power to account? The, the two things are always intertwined, power and money. So you follow the money. So corruption is connected to that. Um, but the other side is it's easy to expose. That just requires a little courage. And like, you know, when you're part of a news organization, what's much harder is to actually build. And that's, that to me began in 2005 when I was heading up. The largest news group in the Philippines had about a thousand journalists. We had six international bureaus. I used the honor code. Where's Ben? I used the honor code to kind of uh, to reform this zero tolerance approach to corruption of ABS-CBN is the name of the network. I love that idea. Think about it, whether it's corruption or whether it's you know, whatever it is, you pledge on your honor to make your world, what you're doing, you, you, you do that. You pledge to do it, and then you hold accountable everyone else around you. I'll take that one step further today. We're actually like, we have elections in exactly 80 days in the Philippines. And I always say that the Philippines is going to be the, the domino. If our election, so we have 36 years after um, people power, ousted a dictator, Ferdinand Marcos. His son is now poised to become president, the front runner. And the way he has become that way, the, uh, the front runner is because of social media. We've watched history eroded in front of our eyes. Today, what we're trying to do is um, to create a mesh. And I literally use that because we're trying to find a way to get around social media. Because social media, you know when you're on, on Facebook or Twitter, YouTube, what spreads fastest and further are lies that are laced with anger and hate, right? Content that makes you angry. So you'll see that that gets the widest distribution. It screws with the political system of every country. Um, and so what we're trying to do is to connect. So I'm taking that same idea of like, you, you pledge on your honor, this is your world, to connect all the different meshes. In social network theory, it would be like we would, you would have a boundary spanner. Okay, let me not get geeky. But 
it's that. It's like you pledge on your honor to do the best that you can. You're not going to do the bad things. And then you pledge to hold everyone else around you accountable. If you can hold yourself accountable, if you can be honest to yourself, and then hold your closest friends accountable, you've just started a little piece of paradise. And I always used to say, if I had all my friends together in a deserted island, we would have a fantastic world. But of course, that never happened. But does that make sense? <laughs> I was wondering if there was anyone you, like a, a specific person or like a support system that you had or like maybe inspired you? Yeah, sure. Maybe not. I was class president for three years from freshman, sophomore, junior year. Our senior year, um, I wasn't elected class president. That's a moment of failure, maybe, right? We kind of, everyone assumed I'd get elected class president, but then what happened was, a small group of football players decided that, I would, that they were going to campaign to not make me president. We became friends later on. They succeeded, and it taught me a lot. So here's the lesson that I learned there, I think. You have to have your, your, your confidence. In teachers, at that point, they were fantastic. But it's your friends also, right? Because you'll have moments of disappointment and failure. And sometimes, if you succeed, then you also, I think I was just targeted. But is there still pain? Let me just say, <laughs> no. Um, no, but it was, so it, it's, uh, it, it comes back. Um, at that moment, what did we do? Um, my friends took me to the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Is that still a thing? Yeah. It is, yeah. And then the other part is, I have two groups of friends, and the other one, like, um, took me to Star Wars like 40 times or something like that. We watched Star Wars a lot. So yeah, she had, and then I'll come, I'll come here. And I saw you. I was just wondering if your life has been affected at all since receiving the award. <gasps> I still am doing, you know, that Edward Munch, the, the, the scream, the, the painting. I still feel like that. Um, but my life has been affected in, I think, two ways. More is expected. <laughs> What's that? Spider-Man said it. To whom much is given, much is, you know, you have to do more, right? So a lot more people are coming for help, the things that I don't normally do, right? Like in the Philippines, people who really need help. So I wind up connecting them to people who can help them. But also, if before, so I was already running a company. We're building our own tech, right? So. And I was trying to write a book. I always said I was under two oceans of water. That's normal. You're trying to swim your way up two oceans of water because you overcommit. It's OK to overcommit. After the Nobel, it became four oceans of water. And, you know, and, and then and you realize that, like, oh my gosh, it can get busier. You know? So and I guess the other part, you know, journalists all around the world are under attack. And that's something that hadn't really been recognized. The Time Magazine, person, the person of the year in 2018, they, they called us the gatekeepers, the guardians. That's what they called us, the guardians. Anyone here um, wanting to be a journalist? Yes, of course, you. <laughs> yes. It's, a tough, it's a tough time, but I think you can actually reshape and remold it. I could go to jail for the rest of my life. That's still there. After I get out on Monday, on Tuesday, I will fly back to Manila and I will submit myself to the courts. I had 10 arrest warrants in less than two years because I'm a journalist. Even getting here, they harassed me to the point. Like, imagine if you don't have the right to travel. I have to get court approvals. So three have already been dismissed, but there's still seven cases that are criminal. So I have to ask courts for approval to leave. And I was supposed to have arrived, left on Wednesday, one court. So I got six of seven approvals. One court didn't. It gave a non-denial denial. And so I pushed harder. If I didn't push harder, I could have just said, I guess that means I can't make it. What, it they just made a moot argument. But they gave it. So getting here was a victory. Um, and part of what really pushed me is not just, not just the Princeton is giving me an award tomorrow. The, but you, like coming back, 
Ben was so nice. He just said, we should go to Tom's room. Would you like to? I said, yes. Man. And then I, I was so thrilled to like come back. So yeah, anyway, long answer to your question, isn't it? <laughs> If you can give yourself, well, your younger self, I'm not saying you're old, but I'm just saying. I'm old. It's okay. You no, can say it. No, I won't take no. offense. <laughs> if you could give your younger self one piece of advice, what would it be? Oh, my gosh. Um, don't be afraid. We're all afraid. You know, things scare us. Don't worry so much about not knowing where you're going. That used to keep me up, you know, why don't I know? I should already know. Everybody wants you to choose if you're a senior. Who are the seniors? What are you going to do next year? And there's pressure senior year. Right? Don't, don't let it get to you because it's only the first step. Right? And every choice you make is okay. What's worse is if you don't choose at all. If you like the path that you're on, you keep going. If you don't, you turn. You, you make another choice.